Yeah, I do. No. No. I know what it's going to be. As, as the French say, nous sommes prêts. That mean, it means we're ready. We're ready. We're ready to begin. Um, I wrote some notes, which I'm going to read, uh, otherwise I ramble. Uh, first, I want to welcome you uh, to this inaugural Chancellor's Dialogue of the ACSA College of Distinguished Professors. Uh, Marvin Malika just pointed out to me that this is probably the single largest gathering, certainly, of the topaz as well as the distinguished professors as has ever occurred. And for that, I think I am personal, personally, but I think we should all be very grateful and hopefully we'll continue to meet this way. Uh, the college was founded just a year ago as a means of bringing together those awarded the title of topaz laureate jointly by the AIA and ACSA and or distinguished professor by the ACSA. A meeting of the college uh, immediately preceding this program attended to the business of the college. We welcomed our new members. We celebrated a friend departed. We reviewed our progress in creating a mentoring program for faculty, establishing grants and awards, continued to investigate fundraising strategies and support these activities. For those of you interested in knowing more about the college and its activities, there is a presence on the ACSA website, and we invite you to visit there. In addition to the above regular business, this session inaugurates an additional initiative titled The Chancellor's Dialogue. The purpose of the college, as stated in its mission, in addition to mentoring best practices, advancing architectural education, and service to society at large, is to stimulate a sharing of interest amongst its colleagues. This meeting is my furtherance of that purpose. As a precedent, this year's event brings before us a member of the college that is in the process of writing, completing, or has just published a book. With the distinguished membership of the college, it is assumed that each year the standing chancellor will designate a member of the college to present their work for discussion between and among the college members, members and visitors. Another of this year's initiatives was to create and then expand an archive on the works of college members, including gathering as many on-camera talks by members of the college as possible. Then, as you visit uh, the website and the names of those noted on the website, those having clips can be watched and heard. From what I have found, the pieces are meaningful and rich in information and insights into the college members, their lives, and their contributions. We couldn't locate a clip of uh, Robert Geddes, hence this session will be recorded and posted on the DPACSA website. It seemed a perfect fit of desire, need, and opportunity to post a video that will ensure Dean Geddes' comments and the panel discussion following will be available broadly for students, faculty, and other interested parties. So here we are this afternoon with four Topaz laureates here who will share their thoughts in response to uh, Dean Geddes' manifesto entitled FIT, the catalyst for today's first chancellor's dialogue. I would like to introduce Dean Geddes and our respondents. Your program has their bios for reference, and you each should have a set of pictures uh, that uh, Dean Geddes has provided. That having been said, I seem to have lost the rest of the notes that I wrote. So I'm going to uh, extemporize. Uh, I have known Bob Geddes uh, for about 45 years. He was the dean at Princeton when I arrived there at uh, the invitation of uh, Bernard Spring and Dean Geddes to do research, housing research, and to teach. Uh, during my years at Princeton, I had uh, the, the privilege of watching uh, Dean Geddes build one of the best and most influential faculties uh, that has ever existed in, in uh, this country. I think you will find some good words and comments about that in Joan Ockman's book. Uh, he was personally extremely helpful to me. Uh, he helped guide a young faculty member's growth and change. Uh, he never wavered in being supportive. Uh, to me or to anyone else that I knew he came in contact with. Uh, in that regard, I think he lived up very well to the principles and the morals and the ideas that he espoused. 
He took that school through unbelievably turbulent years. I arrived in 1968, and as some people know, Peter as well, that those were the years of, of turmoil in this country and around the world. And he guided people with grace and dignity and intelligence, uh, meeting with students uh, out on lawns and helping them to understand what their uh, obligations were, what their responsibilities were, and how they could weather the storm that we all were uh, witnessing at the time. So uh, from very, very early on, I developed a, a very high uh, level of regard and deep level of respect for what Bob did and what he represented. So it's, of course, a great privilege um, to be here today introducing him at this moment in his, in his career when he has just finished what I do believe he said was his first book um, uh, at a time when I think what is of greatest concern to him uh, especially in the gathering of the Digital Aptitudes uh, Conference should be of great influence and importance to us. Uh, I do remember one comment that uh, Bob said to me at one time, um, which I'll share with you before he gives his remarks. He said that, uh, uh, he said a word is worth a, a thousand pictures. Uh, and. Uh, that day, somebody said, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, one word from the moon is worth <laughs> even more. So I look upon the words that Bob's delivered, uh, delivers as each um, being worthy in that way. I don't know anyone that I've ever listened to who is more precise in what he has to say and, more, and, and has greater depth in each step along the way. So with that, I'm going to now introduce Bob, ending my personal comments, and our other respondents on the panel, and then I will turn it over to him. Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm not. Okay, Bob Geddes, I'm not gonna read. I know Bob Geddes well enough. Bob Geddes uh, was, was a graduate of uh, all of our major schools. He, he went to Penn, he went to Harvard. He has uh, directed uh, Princeton. He's won, uh, he, he is uh, the founding partner of Geddes, Brescher, Calls and Cunningham, which has produced a, an extensive body of work, most of which many of you are familiar with. Uh, uh, he went on from his uh, deanship at Princeton to be for, become the first loose professor of uh, urbanism at NYU. Uh, where he stayed until he uh, decided to return to Princeton and take up emeritus status writing this book there. Uh, Stan Anderson, uh, DP, uh, uh, PhD, DPASA, and uh, FAIA, not FAIA, sorry, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, 2004 Topaz Laureate. Stan is a professor of history and architecture at MIT head of the Department of Architecture from 91 through 04. Stan's research and writing concern architectural theory, early modern architecture in Northern Europe, American architecture and urbanism, and epistemology and historiography. He was a Fulbright Fellow at the Technical Hoch School in M Munich and subsequently a Fellow uh, of the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation at the American Council of Learned Societies. Don and Linden, 1997 Topaz Laureate, FAIA, is the Eva Lee Professor of Emeritus, Professor Emeritus of Architecture and Urban Design at the University of California. Professor Linden's work as an architect, author, and educator concerned with the design of places has been widely recognized. Within CED, he was a member of the graduate group of the Design of Urban Places and taught in both the Architecture and Master of Urban Design programs. Uh, Donlin Linden served as the head of the Department of Architecture at the University of Oregon, MIT, and is former chair of the Department of Architecture at Berkeley. Adele Naut Santos, FAIA, 2009 Topaz Laureate, was appointed Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT in 2004. Previously, she was professor at the University of California at Berkeley, College of Environmental Design. Before Berkeley, she was the founding dean of the University of California at San Diego School of Architecture and professor of architecture and urban design at the University of Pennsylvania, where she was also chair of the architecture department for six years. In addition to her academic world work, she's principal uh, architect in San Santos Prescott and Associates 
a prolific firm based in San Francisco. With that, please welcome Dean Geddes. Thank you, Lance. Um, this is an awesome group to speak to. Uh, all of you have every right to think that you should be here. And in fact, I think you probably would do, you should. Uh, I, um, to, to show you how nervous I got, I left my speech in the room. And if it were not for Stan Anderson's generosity, we would be speechless. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this is the first Chancellor's Dialogue, and in that respect, I feel it's a, a special responsibility to see how it can be, in fact, a discussion rather than a presentation. Uh, it, it, it will, can I have a drink of water? It will start in two places. First, um, it starts at the 50th reunion of my graduating class from the Graduate School of Design. And secondly, thank you. Secondly, <clears throat> it starts in my trench coat uh, in World War II. Um, first, the GSD reunion. Um, we invited Nat Glazer to join us. Uh, Nat is a beloved person, a in public intellectual, uh, an urbanist, um, a social scientist, and he adores architecture. But he worries. And he speaks of, quote, I'll quote Nat, <clears throat> quote, the, the, the growing disenchantment of an early enthusiast of modernism, that's Nat and me and many others, um, an enthusiasm of modernism in architecture and urbanism, and who, when they're young, is not such an enthusiast, but a concern with the failures of modernist architects and planners in dealing with contemporary urban life. We were all concerned at that reunion as to why he was so uh, upset. What was his uh, real concern? And, uh, he wrote a, an essay later, which he collected in his uh, last publication, as a matter of fact, of, of essays. And he said, because modern ar modernist architects once wanted to improve the lives of everyday people, now they hope to astonish and amuse their elite clients. I took that very personally. There was a, was a story about a, a psychologist conference where they said, a design conference, they said, you know, the trouble with architects is that they all take things personally. And somebody in the back of the room stood up and said, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that could have been me. I mean, I, I feel that way about it. I love Nat, and, and I thought that it was um, something to really consider. So this book, my first, is actually a response to Nat Glazer's uh, remorse. It's a manifesto not about me, or, or, or it's really a, a manifesto about architecture and society. It seeks to fundamentally improve how architects and the public think about the possibilities of design. Uh, it starts with the tip of the hat to John Dewey. Now, uh, why John Dewey? Because John Dewey, perhaps more than anyone, uh, led uh, our thinking uh, in American philosophy to art and, and architecture as experience, to the reality of architecture, buildings, cities, and so forth, in terms of how we experience it. Um, it explores architecture um, as we live every day, how we, how we live and, and, and work, uh, what we do, and how we do it in, uh, in the increasingly constructed environments of cities, but also the constructed environments of, of nature itself. But it also asks the question, why do we not just live in nature? Why does society care about architecture? And does it really matter? I try to examine architecture itself, not only what surrounds architecture, all the disciplines and activities and so forth, but what it itself 
is in three ways, in three points. Or any of you who know me realize that somehow it all works out to be three. But you'll see later that that's not the case anymore. <laughs> the argument is that I pose in this book is that the origin, origins of architecture is in nature, it, that its task is the combination of function and, and expression, and its legacy is form. Now there's several things in that that are sort of subtle points. Um, especially that the task is the combination of function and expression, not one or the other, but that they're two, the two are really combined. That there is no function without some expression, and there is no expression without some aspect of function. It's the combinatorial aspect of function and expression that I think is the significant uh, step. Um, anyway, those three the origin, the task, and the form is not what I want to talk about this evening because it's really kind of below your radar. I mean, it's what, <laughs> with Peter Waldman in the front, I realize I remember when, when you know, he was just little Peter Waldman. These were, <laughs> <laughs> these, these were the things which we would discuss in Architecture 101, and we'd go over and over and over. So I'm not going to go through that. I, I, I want to talk about us today. Okay, I started to write this book after a decade at NYU and, and, and New York. Uh, Lance, it was not a, a professorship of urbanism, it was a professor of architecture, urbanism, and history. And it was a unique professorship in that they required that I spend half my time as part of the university in public affairs. Uh, the dean of the faculty would sit down with me and tell me uh, what they expected, and every semester we'd work out a plan. So I worked with the, with the Regional Plan Association, with the Architects Chapter, uh, with the United Nations, and so forth. Um, it was a marvelous uh, experience, and it, and it really uh, responded to NYU's desire to connect to the, to the community. Anyway, I came back to Princeton. I was repotted into uh, the one wing of the Princeton University Press building, uh, a building, a U-shaped building with, and one wing was given back to the university for faculty who were writing books. I, uh, I was one of the caged emeriti, we, we, as we called ourselves. Anyway, um, I had been away from Princeton for more than 20 years. Uh, Rip Van Winkle returns, and um, I began by reading thinking and writing. Uh, it took about five years to come to some worth, what I think are worthwhile conclusions. And I gave uh, the book a working title, which was very imaginative, Why Architecture Matters. I was very pleased with that title. The editor of the University Press said, well, why don't you go over to Labyrinth University Bookstore across Nassau Street and look around, see what else is on the shelf. What's the competition? I came back and I had discovered that there were two books with exactly that title for sale right now, Why Architecture Matters. And they're both by Pulitzer Prize winners. Paul, Paul Goldberger at, from Yale Press, Why Architecture Matters, and uh, Blair Kamen, University of Chicago Press, Why Architecture Matters. They're very good books. I could never write that well. In fact, I, I recommend them to you. But <laughs> it was pretty obvious that I had the wrong title, uh, but I went back to the editor and I said, Peter, what are we going to do? He said, oh, no, no. He said, that's very good news. How so? He said, well, it shows people are interested. Well, then he said, well, maybe we should call it Why Architecture Really Matters and stick it to it. <laughs> <laughs> and that would, have, uh, that would have said something to Yale Press. <laughs> anyway, um, the book, and its title evolved very slowly. Uh, for decades, I had been teaching, for 35 years, I'd been teaching Architecture 101. Some of the products are here. Um, and I'd relied heavily on the Vitruvian Triangle of, you know, um, and it's that, and it's, and it's extraordinary progeny. I mean, you can hardly read a book on architecture without some 
triumvirate. Even the latest statement of the, of the dean at Rice, for example, has that triumvirate. It, it, I think most of you have used it one way or, or, or another. My version, uh, which came out of Norbert Schultz, uh, I think it was an un, untranslated version from the Norwegian, but it was um, for task, form, and techniques. And, and one year, the class was very clever. They asked me to recapitulate the uh, course in the last lecture. So I did. I went up there, task, form, techniques. Tony, that's the triangles, right? And the class said, thank you very much. And they all got up, and they had T-shirts on, which said task, form, techniques. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I always did it with some sense of unease. It never completely, if I may jump the gun, fit. I never understood really what it, you could have the provision of the three, but it wasn't clear that it was the architect's responsibility to make them fit. So how the triangle actually worked led me to reject simple modernist uh, alternatives. I mean, the linear form function, arrow form follows function, but then Frank Lloyd Wright, Frank, the arrow going the other way, and then all the smart guys saying it goes both ways. And it seemed evident that the real issue was, was the fit between form and function in, 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 that, in that respect. Uh, so that led really to consider that maybe fit is the keystone to many of those relationships. Uh, form, fit, techniques, techniques, fit, form. Form, fit, expression, expression, fit, form. And then one most close to me is physical form and social form. Physical form fits social form, social form fits social, uh, physical form. The recurrent theme is always that the architect's task is to, to be concerned and to be the leader and the, the form, the, to formulate uh, the fit. Um, fit the purpose, fit the place, and I believe in critically, fit the future. Um, this could be an extraordinarily conservative viewpoint, but it shouldn't be, and it isn't. I mean, it could be an argument always for fitting to the past. And God knows at Princeton right now, we just built um, a very dull Gothic uh, revival. But we've also built an absolutely marvelous, forward-looking, um, progressive library for the sciences. Um, so it is, it's really important that the architect, the third level of the fit, fit the purpose, fit the place, is to fit for the future. Because you're building the future. There's, there's no way in which you may like, like, like to erase the past, but there's no way in which, in fact, you can redo the past. But you can, in fact, prepare to build uh, for, for the future. Um, I think the essence of the whole thing is that fit recognizes the relationship between architecture and society as a dialogue. Dynamic, complex, and, and when carried out with knowledge and skill, extraordinarily rewarding. I, some examples are, in, are going to be in. By the way, I also decided to, to make the book 100 pages on the assumption that no architect I know would ever read more than 100 pages and remember the first page. So it's, it's small, enough, small enough that you really, it's a package. And then um, I discover in the technology of, of the printing and publishing world that if you have color photographs and kind of ma manage to put them on glossy pages in one package of eight pages, that it'll occur somewhere. But you don't know where. It may not occur at the end where you might like. So what I essentially did was create a package of eight, which all of you are welcome to look at and not read the book, because it's all there. I mean, it, in fact, it recapitulates the argument with the pictures that uh, Lance uh, mentioned, and not so much the words. So there are a series of, of, of dual you know, diptychs, they used to say at Princeton. Uh, for example, um, comparing Jefferson's Academical Village in Virginia and Frank Lloyd Wright's Usonia House One in Madison, Wisconsin. Both of them 
are social forms, Jefferson conceiving of a new idea of a university and a physical form for it. Frank Roy Wright conceiving of a, a house for, for America, Usonia, North America. Uh, I have a special love of <laughs> Usonia One because when I met Evelyn, she was a graduate student at, at the University of Wisconsin. I think, I think it's true that my opening line to her was, would you like to go look at a Frank Roy Wright house with me? My children think it was a very good line, but we in fact did. Uh, and that Jacob's house in Madison uh, was uh, our, our first uh, trip looking. Anyway, um, the Jacob's house is an extraordinary social idea. After uh, Alan Chemikoff loves to do these, uh, it's like that. Sure, it has these two wings, the garden, the hearth, the family wing, the living room wing, and it is very much a social idea and a physical idea. It's quite remarkable, of course, that that house was built just about the same time as Falling Water. I think it's an extraordinary uh, achievement. It's a combination of, of those two, and obviously I, they are both essentially buildings of the landscape as well as of, 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 of houses, buildings. Uh, another uh, combination that uh, comes to the fore is a comparison of uh, the New York Public Library building on Fifth Avenue at 42nd Street and Rockefeller Center. Um, both great American achievements. The public library is on my conscience a lot because in all those glorious years at Harvard, I never heard of John Carrere or John Carrere and Hastings. Now, it's an admission that don't, it isn't, doesn't say well about me, but the fact of the matter is that the achievement of Bozar theory of urbanism, the achievement of the City Beautiful movement, um, Carrere, for example, uh, served on the, the group plan board for Cleveland, which, which was the, his contribution uh, to uh, thinking about how you, you make a group of buildings rather than just an individual building. That never was, was on the discussion. But I think it's an extraordinary achievement. The facade facing uh, Fifth Avenue, the facade facing Bryant Park, um, it's now going to be, the lower levels are going to be rebuilt by Norman Foster into a, a great circulating library, the great room above, the great steps, the lions. It's an extraordinary uh, urban uh, achievement and extraordinary piece of architecture. And of course, Rockefeller Center, it was built as a group of buildings. It was moved, grouped by, with a group of architects with a shared understanding of, of architecture, with a shared understanding of what axes and points and verticality meant. Uh, it is to our, to our shame that we are not able to match anywhere near what that was. Uh, I sometimes think what might have happened to American architecture if World War II had not happened. And we might really have continued the development of that kind of thinking uh, of group architecture and um, urbanism. Well, anyway, that's, that's, that's examples of the architecture. I, I, on the urbanist level, um, two places are compared. Pike Place, the market and the neighborhood in Seattle, Steve, <laughs> and uh, Millennium Park, in particular Frank Gehry's contribution to that last piece, that marvelous uh, bandshell lawn, the acoustic uh, trellis, it's extraordinary. But also the meandering bridge. I mean, all of that uh, contributes to the notion that architecture today, and maybe architecture of tomorrow, can play its role within uh, uh, urbanism. I, I, Pose the, po the point that these two, uh, Pike Place and Millennium Park, are examples of civic populism and civic monumentalism. Now, if you'll turn the, the flyer over, do you have a flyer? Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you turn it over, you get this, okay? Now we start again from my trench coat pocket. 
in World War II. Um, in 1944, Fayetteen Press in London published a wonderful small book. It was printed on thin onion skin paper. It was bound in a beautiful red burgundy cloth with gold type, uh, typeface, which proclaimed <clears throat> the civilization of the Renaissance in Italy. I was absolutely smitten. Here I was um, <laughs> in the United States Army reading about 1380 and 1480 and pictures of buildings and landscapes. And it stayed in my pocket through the rest of the war and has stayed on my shelf ever, ever since. It was a new edition of the, of the, of the 1860 version of uh, Burkhardt's book with very typical British understatement. It said, <clears throat> it is hoped that this volume in handy form will be more useful than the earlier, bulkier editions. <laughs> Indeed it was, because it fit in my trench coat. Anyway, I was totally smitten. It had delicious chapters, like the state as a work of art and society and festivals. That's long before the spectacle came along. Anyway, it was about the fit between architecture and society. Small wonder then, when we appointed our first, at Princeton, when we appointed our first joint professor in architecture and public affairs, that the opening, the inaugural event uh, of Paul Ilvesacker's tenure was dedicated to, to Jacob Burkhardt's book. Now, I'm well aware where it fits and is not at the forefront of your thinking about, about it, but it was an extraordinary stimulus um, to, to, to me, and I want to pay thanks to that. There are, however, two paintings beyond Burkhardt. There are two paintings from the Italian Renaissance that are the most powerful images in my book. They are, they connect architectural history with intellectual history, history of ideas, with social history, and political history. The first of them is the Lorenzetti fresco painted, as you know, in about 1337-39, uh, painted on the east wall of the council chamber in Siena. Um, it shows the effects of good government. And as fate would have it, on the west wall, the effects of bad government have worn very badly, so we really don't know all of the bad effects, although it's pretty obvious when you look around the world today <laughs> what they are. Um, they were painted for the ruling group, the ruling council of, Vienna, uh, of Siena, which was the Nine. Therefore, it's small wonder also that the focal point of that uh, fresco, and actually, believe it or believe me, the source of light uh, for the painting, because it's very interesting to calculate where the source of light in a Piero painting or, a, or, or uh, these paintings. The, the, the source of light is the group of nine figures that are dancing in the street. The nine, of course, the nine figures, the nine of uh, Siena. This image is immensely popular. It occupies, in, in Janssen's standard textbook on the history of art, uh, a, a full color page. It occupies a double page in the catalog, the splendid catalog, on the representation of architecture that Hank Miller was the general editor for. And it occupies two full chapters in Quentin Skinner's book of art intellectual history called Visions of Politics. In architecture and urbanism, this allegory of good government explores civic populism, which is the spontaneity of place and occasion, the asymmetry of grouping, the vernacular modularity of windows, doors, and arcades, with a very necessary touch of civic monumentalism, specifically the city wall and gate. The other picture, other image, the ideal city, as you know, is a small panel painted around 1480 
for the sole ruler of Urbino, the Duke, the authorship had long been a matter of conjecture. Recently, and if there were a headline out of this event, maybe some of you didn't know this, but x-rays and photographs of the work taken by a group of scientists in Italy, explored by Professor Morelli, at the, Professor of History uh, at Florence, suggest clearly that the precise pattern of lines and spaces the organization of the buildings and so forth, the buildings themselves are the result of Alberti's base drawing. That it is a painting, maybe even partially by Alberti, on a drawing of Alberti himself. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see just to the right of the central rotunda, you'll see a small building, which is just right out of uh, Alberti's own book, uh, pattern book, if he had one. Anyway, his designs, um, uh, were manifest in this place, for, and, and I suppose you could say was really this a, a, a visual essay on ideal architecture in an ideal society. Martin Kemp, the historian at Oxford, said, "Only, only the people, only the people are missing. Um, the ideal city seems to be waiting its ideal citizens. Will this?" And then the question: Will the ideal city? form them, shaping their values, or have people, the existing people, designed this city as their utopia? Now, Colin Rowe modestly, in, in um, his, his essay of the uh, architecture of utopia, Colin rather modestly identifies this painting as, quote, perspective of a square. He didn't want to overstate the case. Um, and. Um, he doesn't really identify for sure who designed it, big question mark. But it, it is a triumph in his essay, which is the last essay in uh, Mathematics of the Ideal Villa. Anyway, he says, this is quote, Colin, speaking directly. This picture can well be allowed to serve as a representation of just the city which humanist thought envisioned. Fully, fully to understand the revolutionary quality of this space, one should compare it with some medieval square, and then here is the, the, my great discovery in all this, quote, this is what Colin ends, which, he says, incidentally, one might prefer. <laughs> That's very Colin. I think it's pretty clear where his emotions lie. Anyway, the issue is that, that is posed between these two images and I don't believe that these two images have been shown in architectural history or art history. Do any of you know an example, please let me know, where the two are compared? It would be very helpful to me to, to, to know. Otherwise, I'm going to claim originality, which is, you know, very desirable. <laughs> anyway, um, these images for me continue uh, to frame the, the debate uh, between uh, monumentalism, populism, architecture, and, and urbanism. They pose for me the possibilities of, 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 a, of a new progressive era. Now, in fairness to you all, I should tell you that Stan and the others also got a quote from Christopher Wren, and I know Stan wants to make some comments on that. I will uh, tell you what it is because it just reinforces the whole issue. And it's in Collins' book. It starts the essay. Wren claims that there are two claims that there are two causes of beauty, natural and customary. You probably all know this, but anyway, it was new to me, and I thought it was terrific. Natural, he says, is from geometry, consisting in uniformity, that is, in equality and proportion. Customary beauty, natural beauty, is geometric. Customary beauty is begotten by use, as familiarity breeds a love for things not in themselves lovely, and so forth. He compares natural beauty and customary beauty. And it seems to me that's very similar to the comparison of monumentalism, geometric, structured, uh, largely led by government, but not entirely, uh, and, and uh, uh, customary beauty, which is uh, developed by, by, by use. Uh, the reason these are, are important, I think, is that 
these two images is that they pose the possibilities for the connection between architecture and society and architecture and politics right now in this election year. It is possible that we could create a new progressive era, that we could be on the, on the cusp of an era comparable to the, to the period of 1870 to 1920, uh, to, to the uh, era with uh, Franklin Roosevelt's lead, uh, to an era that might lead, might lead to a new issue of progressive architecture. If you look at the history of Pencil Points magazine, how many of you know, have ever heard of, I hope you have. You're old enough, that's good. But Pencil Points was a wonderful magazine because it was aimed at the craft of architecture, at, at drawing. In fact, it was really aimed initially at the draftsman. Lou Kahn and the T-Square Club, Pencil Points was very important to, to, to them. Well, Pencil Points started about in the 1920s and somewhere along the way, one of my newly discovered heroes, Tom Creighton, uh, I think was the main uh, impetus toward changing pencil points into a new magazine of the new modernism. For about a year, there was a transition in which it was called the new pencil points, giving some clue. And then it became the architecture of progressive architecture, the, the magazine of progressive architecture. It lasted, John Morris Dixon was its last editor and I've talked with him at length about, about this. It lasted until um, 1995 and it died just about the time when pencil points died and was taken over by the computer. And that's the interesting connection to this conference. Pencil points, progressive architecture, and I submit the possibility of a new progressive architecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, before I give the floor to Donlan Linden. I was wondering whether anyone uh, listening had any burning questions uh, for Bob uh, as he concludes we these later? remarks. <laughs> Can hmm? we do it later? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I, you know, sometimes what happens is you have, a, you have a person who just is, is just uncomfortable. They, they, just can't, they just can't sit there with their burning question. So I like to offer the option. If nobody takes it, that's fine too. And, and as no one has, we're gonna give the floor to Don and Lyndon, who's our first respondent to, to Bob's comments. Oh, it's the metal, oh. <laughs> Echoing off the metal. <laughs> Thanks, Bob, for uh, launching this discussion this way and for bringing those two great images to mind. Um, what they share in common is a conviction rendered in paint that the physical form of the city says something important about our aspirations. Certainly in the Siena image, of the effects of good government, the world it depicts is full of people and actions of various sorts and motivations, embedded within and on the edges of constructed elements and, and constructed enclosures, towering territorial claims and places of outlook. Piero della Francesca's, or Alberti's uh, generative uh, uh, sketch, is equally certainly concerned with anticipating some kind of ideal configuration. Yet I've always been equally impressed by the variety instilled within that last image, within that controlling set of arrangements. Each of the buildings shaping the space is distinct, yet each shares in a common vocabulary and a commitment to doing its share, informing the public realm. In my reading, it's not the singularity of the uh, civic monument that is most compelling, albeit very strong, 
but the sense not of singular uniformity, but of cohesion, coupled with variation and accommodation that governs the rest of the co uh, composition. I'd like to share some thoughts uh, about uh, design education for the public realm, using some of your terms and wandering from them too. Um, referring to the civic monumental and civic populism, and of course, most importantly, to your question of fit, which thank you for bringing to the fore uh, the notion that it is a dialogue that matters, um, uh, and that there are things which come together and each piece becomes part of something larger when it fits. Um, and that, I think, is a very, very important um, insight for us all to keep in mind rather than sort of bouncing around with um, polarities. What is the public realm? Well, that's a matter of question, of course. That which we all move through and can inhabit freely without private uh, control. That which we experience, quote, as a public. That which we share by agreement or custom and to which we have access that forms webs of experience that many can share and which serves as a common base for understanding, likely interpreted in many ways, both now and in the future. When we think about the public realm, we cannot limit to that which is owned by the public. Of course, that is the spine of the issue, an armature which is fleshed out by all the places we enter with others by agreement and in pursuit of common interests. Shopping, for instance, in places of entertainment, this hotel, that are regulated in ways that are defined, usually by admission fees, yet ensure access without discrimination and carry uh, uh, memories of things uh, from one person to another. Important issues for designers are the ways in which the environment comes to be a representation of how we are as a society, and the issues of gathering uh, that have uh, really come to the fore in the last uh, year even more of the Arab Spring and streets and demonstrations and rebellions and the Occupy movement, all of these ways of having our discontent or something more important than that in the Arab cases uh, be brought into physical proximity and reality with individual people and groups of people. How are public spaces created and maintained? Well, there's the haunting phrase, you have to pay for the public life, a uh, title of an article um, that Charles Moore, Moore wrote in Perspective long ago. How do places in which our experience is formed and is expressed get funded and supported? The public and the private are intensely intertwined. Their intersections are the stuff of politics. The essential issue for designers concerned with the public realm is to recognize that entanglement to think beyond project boundaries. A most destructive thing for our cities is for each design process to begin with the confinements of property, for buildings and spaces to be conceived first as they usually are, without regard or accountability to a larger setting, which then comes as an afterthought. We need to teach a design process, I'm sure many are, that seeks out relationships beyond the designated property, whether public or private, that focuses from the outset on how the property, that property or site boundary may become part of something larger, may fit something larger, and contribute to the public realm, can be respectful and attentive as it supports and moves forward our relationships to each other, a gift, if you will, to the realm of experience that we share. Of course, our processes need to address public issues effectively, safety and security, the use of resources and their future. Uh, the prior critical assessments and technical uh, evolution that has taken place. Changing modes of communication and access to information as we're experiencing here, as well as shifts in the way we see ourselves and others. As a profession, we need to be able to account for what has worked and not in technical ways and in experimental, imaginative ways. To highlight and have discourse about projects and places and processes that have the potential to increase understanding of how design work affects public understanding, advances cultural ideas, supports societal development in terms of access and equity. That which is available to all, that which touches us all, that which advances us all, 
Of course, there are endless problems of how you define all, how you define the interests of those your work serves, beyond the interests of the sponsor, beyond the conventions of building types. Uh, we are working at getting better ways of engaging the public. We must imagine the public not simply as an abstraction, but as mentally engaged in imagining, bringing their thoughts into play, reanimating, reinventing the places we will make, and not always to our liking. Always there should be, in all of our work, the issue of public reach. The elements of whatever size reaching out to form something more extensive, of being more than idle, isolated incident. I have one caution regarding fit. Uh, and that is that to some it might sound fixed or passive. Something mm. achieved rather than mm. something sought and ongoing, which is what I think Bob intends. What may help is a sense of greater entanglement, of the vibrancy of multiple lives and impulses, versus corporations and their singular accumulation of power, which can make grand achievements that often must be overcome. Something more like the intertwining of natural forms and processes, their responsiveness to each other, and the creation of ecological groupings. Perhaps we should again think more in terms of urban fabric, of weaving and threads and mending, or even about how things interface. That was very big for a while. We live in an age suffused with discussion of transactions and networks and flows, yet so often the profession still approaches problems as if they were bounded objects to be fixed in time and space by the project limits. It's necessary, certainly, to get a hold on all that surrounds us, to be able to name places and set markers and construct patterns that allow us to grasp and to hold and to give things our attention. As people, we need to be able to reflect, to commit, to care for, and to be able to give voice. To be effective designers, we must think about being able to channel forces and choreograph movements, inhabiting in our minds the spaces and territories we propose, and registering the way that nature moves through them. We would benefit from thinking more about places as counterpoint, with multiple initiatives and scales overlapping and carrying many messages and overtones, and with people lending their voices to the implicit discourse. Perhaps we need to think more like musicians, not the tired simile of architecture as frozen music. Architecture is frozen only if you consider the objects that define spaces and not uh, take into account the life that flows through and, and settles in their midst. In architecture, we need to imagine, and not only the frame, the beats, but the songs and passions that can take place within them and which in turn gives substance and evocative potential to the place. We should seek places that structure encounters, prompt awareness of things that can have significance in our lives and add to our range of experience of each other and of the environmental and cultural forces from which we draw our existence. In conclusion, I'd like to return to another of the images you described, merging civic populism with the civic monumental. You spoke about Bryant Park as em embodying populism within the monumental. I think it's interesting that in Bryant Park, it's the frame that takes us there. Mm -hmm. The activities are largely ubiquitous. They're given an attractive force by the frame in which they are set, mm -hmm. which lets us locate the vibrancy and set it in place in our minds, lets us have expectations of what we can find there, and to experience it set within a frame that we know well will also include nature and culture sky and stone, trees, metal, and grass, surrounding moments in the lives of many. I've long argued that the importance of distinct and satisfying places, for, for the importance of distinct and satisfying places, as the goal for city design and for architecture. Places, some say, are a limiting category. They are that only if you think them to be so. If they're seen as confines for thought, rather than as essential foci of attention within a larger network of forces to be channeled. With that, I'll revert to a set of proposed qualities I think can lead to the design of good places, and thus to a more satisfying public realm. Good places are spirited. Good places are respectful. They're developed with close attention to the character and uses of the areas of which they are a part. Good places are inventive. They invest new energies, provide for conditions that were not previously present, structure opportunities for continuing growth and evolution. 
they use resources well. Good places open paths for the mind. They acknowledge that the ways in which we build are extensions of our own bodies and imagination. Good places nourish understanding. They bring our attention to the presence of sun, sky, ground, and water, to the natural order that underlies all. Good places keep human presence before our eyes and firmly lodged within our minds. Perhaps it's a set of injunctions for finding uh, uh, ways of discovering fit. Thank you. Lovely. Stan Anderson. I have not prepared a speech. I, I would like to try to engage Bob and see if we can bring out uh, some partially concealed facts of, of, the, of his essay. Uh, in the, the essay is, is written, and again this evening, he, he began by uh, uh, quoting uh, the uh, text of, of, in which there's this, this disappointment about the condition of, of architecture today. Uh, Nathan Glazer, uh, and uh, let me just read it again quickly since some of you may have come in more recently. So Bob quotes Nathan Glazer, uh, his growing enchantment, a disenchantment of an early enthusiast of modernism in architecture and planning, and who, when young, is not, with the failures of modernist architects and planners in dealing with com contemporary urban life. Why so? Because modernist architects once wanted to improve the lives of everyday people, now they hope to astonish and amuse their elite clients. And you heard tonight uh, Bob uh, say that he, he felt in some way personally attacked in, in this. In, in the text, he says, ouch, that hurts. <laughs> uh, so there's the kind of implication here that uh, Bob will associate himself and his work and his life with what is being attacked by Nat Glazer. But I, I suspect he's not really doing that. Uh, in fact, if you turn back a little ways in, in the text, uh, we come to a, <clears throat> a section in which he's analyzing the modern versus the new modern. So this is now Geddes speaking. The modern style is linked to the politics of social democracy, industrial methods of building, abstract art, cubism and constructivism, the Bauhaus and the international style in brief functionalism. The new modern style is linked to the politics of individualism, economic and cultural globalization, post-structuralism and deconstructivism, computational methods of design and production in brief expressionism. And he goes on about this. The crucial difference is that the modern wanted to build shared, reproducible environments. As the style to end all styles, it wanted to become the norm. He wanted to build social and physical places that fit together in international, in intentional groupings. For the modern, the key word was community. And then he again summarizes the new modern it wants to build unique environments to become a spectacle. Shock is the new norm. It is intentionally unstable. Walls that cant and lean, roofs that bubble and heave, buildings that look like they are inst instantly ready to take off into space or collapse. And then, I'm surprised here, Bob asserts that a favorite book today is Ayn Rand's novel, The Fountainhead. For the new modern, the key word is iconic. Well, I think those comparisons have an invidious relationship to the second set of the new modern, and I suspect that Bob uh, does not really associate himself with that, uh, and that consequently he was not so much offended uh, by Nathan Glazer's comments as feeling that yes, there's something in this, there's something about the social and political condition of our contemporary production that is unsatisfying, and that he would like to address that and, and propose some alternative. So I think the, the, the intent of the book is actually a little different from what the introduction uh, tends to imply. <clears throat> so then what is the book uh, really about? Well, it, 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 the title does reveal it, and uh, Donlan has also uh, referred to it. The, the issue of fit, and I think Donlan made a, a good suggestion of, of making that a still more complex and richer uh, idea. 
uh, and Bob says such things as fit the purpose, fit the place, and to fit the, the social and political conditions. And, and of course, the, the two images that he's talked about uh, are there to, to make this, this argument uh, very powerfully with where we may feel that each of those in their, in their, each of those images in their own way uh, conveys that idea of the fit, uh, not just in a limited architectural sense, but in the larger urban, political, and social sense. I think the, <coughs> the, uh, the last thing I would like to just touch on is that Bob also says that uh, the, the, the last section of his book says the, the legacy of architecture is form. And uh, you've heard his, his very uh, strong endorsement of what uh, was Beaux-Arts design and Beaux-Arts town planning, uh, but also the richness, of the, again, the two images, the, the uh, <coughs> medieval image in, in Siena and the Renaissance image uh, uh, of the classical square. Uh, so that he is embracing a range of form. But also someplace in the, in the book he does uh, come out uh, with a, a, a mild but somewhat strong uh, you know, <coughs> critique of the idea of autonomy. And it's, it's, autonomy is something that has en engaged me not at all because I like the, the stronger implications of that, I, I have the, the same problem that probably Don and, and Bob have that you I want to take these kind of middle positions of fit and, and not, not go to the pole of this or the pole of that. So too with autonomy, if, if you push that to some pole, I'm very uncomfortable. But I also continue the feeling that what, what is architecture if it doesn't in some way pursue ends that are not conveyed by some other means? I mean, if, we, uh, if architecture is only some uh, a realization of scientific uh, ideas or of, so, of strictly social ideas or of engineering ideas <coughs> and architecture doesn't bring anything unique to that, then what is architecture? And there, are, so I think when he says the legacy of architecture is form, uh, that that is an important thing and it may then deserve a little more generous or nuanced uh, understanding of where, of where autonomy may figure into that. I mean, we probably will finally come back to something like Colin Rowe with the, I think Colin's intellectual drive, which was very strong, would endorse the Renaissance painting. But remember he ended by saying, but we went like the other one more. <laughs> and so there's, there's the life of intellect and there's the life of feeling and the life of rich urban experience. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Adele Santos. Okay. Nice, uh, You guys are good. <laughs> well, Stan, thank you for making the bridge <laughs> because I haven't uh, created a speech either. Uh, but thank uh, Donlan, that was, that was wonderful and so, so were you, Bob, very fabulous. First of all, I just want to thank you for creating this charming book because it really is charming. Uh, it's, um, I read it through several times actually mm. and um, and it really reminds us of the essential attributes of what is architecture and what is urbanism. Uh, and it was, that is it, no doubt very important. And um, I think it's a manifesto of kind. Um, it's somebody who taught 101 for many years who's now rethought the whole situation and put it in a text that I think will be very illuminating and quite inspirational for, for the young architect who, who is setting forth. And it's also a book for everybody. It's a book for um, people who are not architects but are interested in architecture. And um, what's important is you've lo you really asked a lot of questions. Uh, you've provoked the imagination. Uh, and you've left us with some pretty imponderable things, I have to say. And um, I totally agree with the spirit of the book. But there are parts of it that, um, whilst I agree with it philosophically, um, it, it leaves me with some worries. Um, I mean, it states quite uh, categorically that the oath of architecture is make it fit. That's a pretty strong statement. Um, you also note that the modern architect's task remained combinatorial, which is actually pretty useful. So it's the idea that we're not single-mindedly doing what we're doing, but there's a much larger and complex world in which we have to start 
to mix and match and, and uh, move between uh, different kind of domains. Um, so the, this, this idea of fit, which, you know, sorry, I, I, I went off in a toot on fit because it um, is something that I know in my earlier teaching I used to talk about a lot, and I've got some doubts about it today. Um, so, you know, fit probably, um, besides the actual purpose that an architect is, is given, the problem set, you know, you have to deal with social cultural contexts. That is for real. We have to deal with political cult co contexts as well. We have very strong environmental factors these days that we have to deal with. Technological realities are getting to be extremely sophisticated and wide-ranging. Um, economic constraints, we can't ignore them anymore. And the fit in the physical context seems the easiest one for us to cope with. It's something we can see and we can imagine. So in my earlier design teaching, I used to argue a lot for understanding these kinds of issues uh, in the design process and uh, to look at these things analytically and that the form and aesthetic really grew out of understanding the nature of the problem set. Uh, it was not form for its own sake. It was not architect as an autonomous artist. Okay. And um, so, you know, this is all very moral, you know, uh, and a little strident perhaps in those days. And uh, one realizes later in life, of course, these things are, are not so absolute and it's pretty complex. Uh, because, you know, who makes the judgments anyway? It's, it's, you know, what, how do we know that something fits or it doesn't fit? Um, people have opinions by disciplinary focus, um, whose judgment is correct, um, you know, and, you know, can we reach consensus? Seldom. Um, and, you know, I, opinions change over time. I always think about Pruitt Igo, for example, that we all thought was such a fantastic complex and was much awarded. I've recently been involved with, um, looking at a failed new town of the 60s uh, in Japan, which was very similar to failed new towns all over the place. We got it so damn wrong. We thought we knew and we didn't know. And, uh, you know, that, that's pretty awesome because the amount of investment in placemaking, honestly, with the, th the thought that we're really providing environments that would be fantastic to live in. Tama New Town, uh, outside of Tokyo, turned out to be a, a disaster. But everybody wanted to live there. It was touted as the, as, the, as the best and the most intelligent and the most livable and the most ecologically friendly and all these kinds of things. So, um, you know, and we know the design process is always imperfect. So, and so I'm talking now wearing my architect's hat. Um, and what makes it very complicated is that buildings are part, even private buildings are part of that spatial domain that you spoke about, you know. And so that even though we might be problem solving one set of things, we're affecting a whole set of, of, of other things. And um, so, you know, and ultimately buildings are judged by their form and their aesthetic. So, so much one can take the position of, of trying to make a, a really understandable set of, of rationales about what we're doing. In the end, the durable part of it is that which everybody sees and everybody owns. Uh, and even though it might have been a, a, private, uh, a privately uh, conceived of um, a story in the, in the beginning. Uh, and even, honestly, public structures that go through comprehensive review processes do not guarantee quality in the long run uh, because of the, the nature of our democracy, the way we go about building things, and, and so on. And, you know, having been in the public process a lot in my life, certainly on the West Coast, um, it's, it's really scary stuff. Um, but you also say the built environment is always becoming in your book. It always is. It's, it's, it's incomplete. And uh, so you actually talk about the fit for future possibilities. So fit actually in your mind, although it's, it starts off with a very moral tone now, actually uh, understands that this is difficult to do, uh, that things are evolving, the future is filled with questions we cannot um, answer. And, uh, you know, so fit and obsolescence, you know, if it's, the fit is better, it becomes more likely to be obsolete in the long run. And, um, and so, you know, there are many arguments made for loose fit, yes. barely fit, yes, and so on and so on. So, you know, fit in itself is, is an incredibly nuanced notion. Um, and um, I think somehow, I, I, I think we have to pull this apart, actually. And we have to look at notions of durability in a time frame. 
we have to um, look at relative significance of certain things versus others. How do we prioritize the notion of fit? And you know, uh, and what are the most important imperatives in this whole whole discussion? So I think what you've done is it's it's a wonderful, readable, inspiring manifesto. And some of the discussions at the end, actually, about those two pictures, etc., are almost to me more interesting, you know, than. Uh, fit as, as it was posited in the beginning, you know. And uh, I'm not being critical, Bob, I'm just, this is just a thought. A as I, yeah, a it's a thought. And uh, so uh, I think it's philosophically absolutely correct. And it's incredibly difficult to do. So I'd like to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. You, you raised your hand at a moment while Don was speaking. Was there something you wanted to share? Are you talking to? Uh, no, I was talking to Bob. To I thought Bob. there was a moment that you. Yeah. Fit is like justice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's an effort. It's, it's, it's very moral. It's very moral. <laughs> yeah. So we, we've had, uh, I think we've had a, um, Thank you all. An, an extremely rich response to what Bob offered by people who uh, delved into it um, chapter and verse and spoke, um, I thought, very sincerely about what they both uh, got from it and what it, it, it sort of drew from them. Uh, so I, I will again ask if anyone here would like to uh, raise any questions or make any comments? Yes, Peter. Um, so as an undergraduate, I didn't have the benefit of having Bob Gillies as my teacher, uh, but you were there uh, uh, when I was a graduate student and dean, and actually was generous enough to hire me first and started teaching, no. teaching, which I never thought I would get into. Peter? I, uh, you have 50 behind you, you try this. No, that, <laughs> probably destroyed that, but why don't you use this, Peter? Yeah. Sorry, I thought there was I thought there was a roving mic here, so sorry, we'll have to use that sir. Use this, use this, it's mine. Well, I won't go over my perspective of uh, Bob as a student and as a uh, my first teacher who actually uh, gave me the privilege of starting to teach way back in 1969. But what I gathered uh, from his first essay and now his last, not his last book, his first book, <laughs> <two years, laughs> is to bring to mind the lessons of the first essay that I was aware of, which was At the Far's Edge. And I think went through the surreal uh, images of the tragic setting and the comic setting and perhaps the uh, satiric setting that was there. And I guess I learned to see way beyond how I was, had the chance of teaching 11 years at Princeton. And so when we get to the ideal city, which is so well contained by geometry and frontality and perspective, and you bring our attention to that the right side might be different because we see an Albertian facade, which might be Santa Maria Novella. My eye doesn't stop there. I look out and there is the forest edge and the pastoral landscape. And so it takes me back that it's not complete and fixed, but actually opens up, and it opens up to surreal, picturesque, or comic setting. But the one we always ignore as architects is really the first one, which is the satiric setting that shows the ground straight away to the quarry, you get stone for building materials, and, uh, and the forest being made into lumber, et cetera, which are the preconditions of architecture and art environmental conditions. So your first essay and now this first book actually seems to make one should read both of them at the same time. And I think these images, 100 years apart in 13, yeah. uh, 40s and, and 1440s, and the Serlian work, I believe, in the 1560s or something like that. Every 100 years, we seem to re-examine, as we're doing now with digital applications, perhaps the same issues of nature as wilderness, as landscape, as urbanism, 
So there's a tie to it. And I think fit is good. It's like a building should not leak too much. <laughs> and, the should pass be vulnerable. and that this doesn't get it all down pat because it is vulnerable and looks out to the orchards and looks out to the wilderness. So I uh, thank you for the lessons again over how many years? I can't believe it. 42 years. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, but I do think that there are more, the more important lessons of this conference and of your important book now is reminding us of the continuity of architectural speculations than necessarily the divisions or polarities that we seem to be at now. So thank you for that. But uh, I think it prompts us to look, which we do well as architects, at the evidence and actually build upon it rather than stopping it. Thank you, Peter. Um, I have a few quick comments um, that I all make, but only upon closing. So I would like to ask if any of the uh, respondents who have generously given their time, but also have had to listen to one another, have any, <laughs> have, have any, any uh, thoughts that they'd like to share in response to what they have heard. Uh, well, may I? Please, yeah, you please do. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lance. Just to prove that the psychologist was right when he said the architect takes, to, takes things personally, um, <laughs> I actually, and I hope Peter Eisenman hears about this, I actually defend the idea of autonomy. Uh, and, and put it in position that if, in fact, it's finally a question of whether it fits. It's not an issue as to, really a serious issue, as to where it starts. It's where it fits, that, that, it, it, that it comes together. Uh, secondly, about, I'm sorry that I didn't have time to uh, give an example but I, of, of how, uh, if you take nature, and by the way, Peter, the forest edge is about 20 pages of the book, and you, get, you don't have to read those parts, but <laughs> it's there. Uh, but if you take nature as the origin, um, it's quite specific architecturally. I chose two examples, light and gravity. I was playing with a third, which was fire, but I realized two, is, two makes the case. Um, and I used examples, for example, Louis Kahn's Exeter Library designed really with light as a, as a palpable part of the conception and the experience. Um, also gravity, it's a very muscular, I mean Lou was a wrestler and you feel the muscular stuff, but the fact is that he thought about and, and demonstrated, embodied gravity and light, and also argue that, that light and gravity are very different. Uh, we know how to use and have used artificial light we don't know how to use artificial gravity, thank God. Um, but we do play with gravity, and we do wonderful things to indicate that we'd like to not have gravity, but oh, it's over. But I mean, light and gravity are the two uh, issues uh, uh, in, under uh, uh, the... Uh. Also, um, I think the real point of this book is to, is to think of architecture as experience, as something that is not uh, just a model or just uh, a concept, but it's in fact experienced by human beings. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I tip my hat to John Dewey, uh, who argued for the judgment of architecture as, uh, as it's actually experienced. And I had one last point. I, uh, when I was a graduate student at Harvard, I got to know Naum Gabau. Uh, the con you know, constructivist architect, sculptor rather, uh, extraordinary uh, intellect. And he invited Evelyn and me to come visit him in, in his studio in Connecticut, uh, in, in the woods. It's beautiful interior, all white. He was in a red flannel shirt. And we're walking through, looking at these uh, extraordinary constructions. And he said, you know, what is form for others is content for me. What's form for others is content for me. I was bowled over. And I was worried for a long while uh, 
about it because it seemed to me it was a step toward uh, formalism and toward an, uh, uh, an autonomy. But then, if I can find it here, here are my quotations in the book. Um, let me read you what, uh, and then he gave me a, a, a copy of a letter that he wrote to Herbert Reed um, during the war. I think really a letter uh, at the, approximately the, um, the D-Day in which he, oh, I don't think I have it. It's in the book. I'll judge what it was. He makes the case that ultimately the constructive experience is what enhances life. And he always believed that it was the experience of the structure, of the space, of the light that he was working on. And that was the constructive notion. That's what he meant by constructivism. It was life itself. And I think that aspect of it uh, we must keep at, in the forefront uh, as we uh, are at the cusp of a new era. I do not believe we are in a late style. I think we are at the beginning of a new style. And I think we have to have a moral uh, and, and a social imagination. For, for me, social imagination is just as important for us as teachers as physical imagination. And the, and the combination, the, the, the combinatorial of, of social and physical imagination uh, is so wonderful. Uh, I know you all get letters from former students. I got a wonderful letter uh, from a student who apologized for being obnoxious 30 years ago. <laughs> Not used to. <laughs> I don't get letters from you. <laughs> no. But, I, I, but he apologized for, for, for that. And then he went on to tell me what he's doing. And um, it's this. He finds little pieces of land in New York, Bronx, and Brooklyn, which are left over. Developers haven't done them. And he thinks about what the possibilities are for those pieces of land, both physically and socially. And he finds institutions, um, foundations, organizations that build for um, aspects of society that are not cared for, but autistic uh, people, uh, uh, elderly, uh, single room occupancy, and so forth. And he builds for them. Uh, and now, the fact that he worked for Aldo Rossi and all that is, you know, fine. But, but he also brings to an extraordinary social imagination. And I think it is, uh, that's the kind of thing that I get great joy uh, out of. So thank you all for being so kind today. Uh, during the um, last uh, uh, four presentations, I made a lot of notes. I thought I would refer back to them, but I don't think I will. I think there are a few uh, comments floating around in my mind, and I would hope there are equally as many floating around in yours. Uh, certainly one of the things that Adele said about the word fit and the fact that there was a period where fit seemed to be a philosophy, if not a theory or a mechanism by which we did work in studio and did other things, uh, may have come and may have gone. But um, I was thinking with the numerous references to um, uh, uh, the space in which architecture exists, much of what I think Donlin referred to, uh, and even the, the ouch that Stanford mentioned, which left me feeling I wasn't sure if I actually understood the first intention of that comment, um, makes me think that we live in a, in a time of such enormous ambiguity. Uh, and especially as we approach the public realm and the society as it's forming, as we move into a unknown territory of a digital age, where this issue of how things fit, whether they be loose or tight, or whether in fact they fit at all, all makes me think all the time of the vast amount of ambiguity that we all live with, and how we confront and deal with that, and in a way, how important that is, how important it is to maintain a wide uh, swath of ambiguity in which 
all of these debates take place, and it's when the lines get very, very hard that we, in a social sense, often come to terms with very, very difficult things that needn't be so decided and so absolute. And I, I think, I, I guess that was referred to um, more than once, and, and I think it's what I would like to take away um, as a sense of what we should dwell on. But the other thing I would like to say, and I, I may have mentioned this briefly at the opening, was uh, whenever it was, eight or nine months ago when this idea of a, of a dialogue um, occurred, uh, and I, I knew Bob was working on a book and I called him up, I actually wasn't sure if he would accept an invitation to come and address this group for all sorts of reasons. One, the simplest being it's a damn long trip up from Princeton to get to Boston. Uh, and and uh, I can't say how uh, pleased I was and how grateful I am for his accepting that invitation, uh, for the people who agreed to join uh, in conversation, uh, for all of you for being here uh, in, in a, a certain kind of camaraderie to listen to uh, a social, uh, humanistic, and very ethical discussion that's the most important discussion we have all the time uh, in the midst of digital aptitude. Um, so I want to thank you all, but I really want to give an enormous uh, debt of gratitude and thanks to Bob Geddes. Tight fit, because what John, what Jonathan does is so disciplined, and it's a combination of basically the institutional yeah, yeah. Oh, and the French hotel and the French hotel. Great. Great. No, this was this was this was really interesting. It was a very nice nice conversation. It was uh, what we were always thinking about. This.